Good morning, everybody, and welcome to New Life Presbyterian Church's online video Easter service. We're very glad that you can join us this morning, wherever you happen to be at this time. Um, at our Good Friday service, Friday night, we sang a song called, Were You There? And in that song, we sang a verse where we said, Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Well, this morning, we're very grateful that there's another verse to that song, which says, were you there when God raised him from the tomb? And that's what we're here to do this morning, is to celebrate an empty tomb. Uh, it's true that we're kind of sad that church buildings are empty this morning because of this pandemic, but we are glad this morning that the tomb was empty on that first Easter morning. And so we say to one another, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Our call to worship comes from the 30th Psalm, and it declares to us the joy that comes, particularly on Easter morning. And so I'm going to read this to you now. We're going to hear from God as he calls us to worship, and then we'll open in prayer. Psalm 30. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Let's pray. Our Father, we come this morning to worship the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who was delivered up according to your definite plan and foreknowledge, who was crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, but who you, God, raised up, freeing him from the agony of death because it was not possible for death to keep its hold on him. For whatever reason, Lord, we might be weeping this morning, we know there is reason for joy on this morning because the one who died, who has borne our sin through sacrifice, is risen. And we give him praise, we give him honor, and ask for your spirit to bless all aspects of this service today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Ecclesiastes. I'll be reading from chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Ecclesiastes 9, 1 through 6. All this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know, both are before him. It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner. And he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. But he who is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. One of the things that the book of Ecclesiastes points out to us is the absurdity and futility of a life that is lived apart from God. Whether you're a righteous person or a wicked person, the writer says, it doesn't really matter because in the end, death comes to all. The dead know nothing and the memory of them is forgotten, so it would seem, if we consider life under the sun, apart from any belief in God, that life is utterly meaningless, if indeed death is the end. But Easter changes all that. The resurrection changes all that because the resurrection tells us that there will be a judgment that we will one day meet God, that there is an afterlife. And so the time to get our hearts ready, the time to prepare ourselves to meet this God is now. The writer says also that the hearts of the children of man are full of evil. And so this is where we begin to get right with God. We acknowledge that truth. We acknowledge the evil that is in our hearts and we look to God for pardon, which he freely offers to all who will come to him through Christ. So wherever you are right now watching this service, let's take a moment, quiet our hearts, and take our sins in prayer to God. Let's do that now. At the very end of the age, we will find that Jesus Christ is not the only person who will have been risen from the dead. Listen to what Paul says to us here in Romans 8.11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. The scripture declares that the wages of sin is death, yes, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so if you are trusting in this Christ Jesus, the one who shed his blood, you're trusting in nothing but his blood and his resurrection from the dead, 
and you're not looking to your religious practice or your moral efforts or your internal goodness, but have placed your faith and hope in him alone, then you have the assurance today all of your sins are forgiven, your shame has been removed, your guilt has been covered, and on the last day, Jesus Christ is going to raise you up in the same way that he was raised up on the first Easter morning. That's the good news of the gospel. That's our hope. That's worth singing about. So let's do that now. and Janet Michaels. We're Larry and Lois Hardy. Hi, we're the Buses. And my name is Carol Ellington. I'm Rachel Jordan. Hi, we're the Shoulders. I'm Brian Stevens. We are Ben and Autumn Lou and Daffy. We're, we're the, the Brown, Brown family. family. Gary and Sue Kiesling. All together now. Hi, Hi everybody goes over the Easter Easter. Easter. We're Kyle and Emily Aldridge. We are the Mises. Hey, Hi, I'm Scott Lee Jordan. Jordan. Hi, we're the Neals. We're the Bergmans. I'm Mark Shea. Hi, I am Pat Barnes, a child of God. What Easter means to me is that because of Christ's sacrifice, we are lavished with love and grace from the Father. Easter means that we have hope because of our risen Savior. Easter means celebrating life. To us, Easter means hope. And if God's will give me more faith. He was crucified. He was resurrected. We are forgiven. Eternal life. Jesus is alive. Jelly beans. Watching the grandkids or cousins all go out and Easter egg hunt together and celebrating Jesus' resurrection. What Easter means to me is that I no longer have to live in fear of the future. Easter means eternal hope. Christ died for us, was buried, and rose again on the third day so that we may have life. To us, Easter means new life. It's the culmination of all that Christ did. 
Easter means to me that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, proving that he is indeed the Son of God. Easter means that Jesus has conquered death with his power and authority. It means that even after the darkest night, the sun will rise again. The short answer is Christ's victory over death. Easter means the dawning of a new creation. What Easter means to me is that through Jesus, I have eternal hope for the future. The promise of eternal life and the assurance of forgiveness to all who trust in Him. Easter means that we have an anchor, we have a comforter, and the assurance of eternal life. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. He is risen. He is risen 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 indeed. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Ah. <laughs> <laughs>in our time apart from one another what a joy it is to be able to hear from our brothers and sisters at new life through that video so thank you to all of you who took the time to prepare and send in a video uh, thanks also to jen robbins and andrew brown for all that they have done to get that video ready for us i want to remind you also not to forget about your tithes and offerings we cannot past the plate this morning, but you are able to give online, and so that information should be on the screen before you right now, uh, so please take advantage of that and uh, remember your giving to the church. Uh, this is a time where we're going to just set aside uh, a few minutes to pray, go to the Lord with our praises and thanksgivings and supplications, so let's do that now together. Our God in heaven, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, because on this day we know that Jesus lives exalted at the right hand of the Father, always interceding for us, we know also, Lord, that therefore you hear our cries for mercy and you respond to our prayers and supplications. And so on this Easter morning, Lord, we pray for Bob and Judy King, Lord, as they struggle with illness and remain hospitalized. We pray, Father, for them and for their daughter, Sherry, also, that you would give strength to their bodies, full and complete healing, wisdom for doctors, hope in their hearts. We pray for quick release, that they would be encouraged in knowing that their brothers and sisters are interceding on their behalf. Father, we pray for Pat Barnes as well, whose daughter Beth gave birth to twin babies this past Friday. Oh Lord, we give you thanks for the gift of life, and we ask, Lord, as the Lord of life, that you would place your hand of favor upon these new precious lives. Lord, give them the treatment they need to sustain their lives as they have been born prematurely, so we pray for strength for their bodies, and Father, for Beth and Pat both, to enjoy a powerful sense of your presence and love for them. Father, we pray for Carol Morgan as well. God gives strength to her as she continues to recover from chemotherapy treatments. Lord, we thank you for the positive developments and the way she has responded so well so far. And we pray, God, that this Easter celebration today would be a happy one for Carol, for Jean, and for the entire Morgan family. Lord, in the midst of this continuing pandemic, we also pray for the following, for protection, Lord, from this virus among all of the people here at New Life, among people here in our community in Muncie and Yorktown, and that the spread of this virus, Lord, in your good providence would be contained and brought to a halt. Lord, we pray for wisdom to be given to President Trump, Vice President Pence, Governor Holcomb, Mayor Ridenour, that decisions that they make would be made in the interest of the public health, in the interest of justice and freedom and righteousness, and that they would make decisions that would 
that would preserve the religious freedom of your church to preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. Lord, for those who have lost jobs or who are fearful that they might be losing their job soon, God, we pray, fill their hearts with supernatural trust in you, a sense, Lord, of your loving, sovereign care for them. And Lord, please show yourself faithful to provide for all of their financial needs during this time of uncertainty. And Father, for the Muncie Mission, we also pray for wisdom and grace to be given to them, to Frank Baldwin in particular and the rest of the leadership there. God, grant to them wisdom as they make decisions about how to best care for the needy men who come to them for help. Lord, we pray that you would protect the residents there and the workers there from the spread of this virus and that you would continue to use the Muncie mission to care for the needy and to spread the gospel to the needy in our community. And Father, one thing we do want to spread is your word. And so, Lord, we pray now for Pastor Brian as he preaches your word to us. Open his lips to declare grace and truth through the scriptures from your holy word that sinners would be saved, that your church would be built up by your spirit, and that the resurrected Christ would be honored and pleased as your word goes forth. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Home, sweet home. There's no place like home. Home is where the heart is. These phrases are common to us because we have attachments and longings for a place that we call home. A place that's marked by love and belonging and order and peace and stability and security and safety. Many of you know that I have a 20-year-old son who will on occasion stay out late and I will freely confess that I always sleep better when I hear the garage door open and I know that he's home, he's home. And yet, as our earth spins, we're flooded with the awareness that there's an awful lot of chaos instead of order, a lot of instability instead of stability, a sense of alienation instead of a sense of love and belonging, and the reality of danger and violence instead of safety, because we find ourselves in a world, in the words of one artist, where the thistles eat the thorns and the roses have no chance. And it ain't no reason that babies come out crying in advance. We're not at home in this world. Instead, we're plagued with this pestering sense of futility and loneliness and fear and an awful lot of anxiety and depression. According to some recent research, one in six adults in the United States is on some kind of mood-altering medication. And mostly this is in the form of antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs. Now, I understand that there are countless reasons, various reasons and factors that uh, go into the experience of anxiety and depression. But one factor that we should consider is that we don't experience this as a place of home. We're not safe here, and we sense that. And the recent coronavirus outbreak has only served to accentuate our awareness that we live in a hostile, threatening, dangerous, unsafe world. In Portland, Oregon, it was reported that 911 calls that involve suicide attempts or suicide threats are up 41% from this time in 2019, just a year ago, and that such calls spiked by 23% in the 10 days following the placement of residents in that area under a state of emergency because of the pandemic. And those statistics just go to show us that we are tempted to adopt the most extreme measures in trying to escape the troubles of life in a world of hurt. Extreme, drastic measures. And yet, what we need to know this morning is that there is a way out of the fear, anxiety, and despair. There is hope for the troubled heart. There is hope that we will arrive at our true home. And there is hope in Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. There is hope in his words in John chapter 14, verses one through six, 
this morning. We're going to take a look at that passage where we will see that our departing Savior offers hope to troubled hearts with the promise of home. And that's the message that we need to hear, that our departing Savior offers hope to troubled hearts with the promise of home. So if you're near a Bible, you have a Bible with you uh, this morning, wherever you're watching, you can follow along in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, where we're going to read that now. These are the words of Jesus. He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord abides forever. This passage ends with a verse that's probably familiar to many of you. It's the sixth of seven I am statements that Jesus makes that are recorded in John's gospel. And yet the passage doesn't begin there. It actually begins with the troubled heart in verse one. Jesus says to his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Now the you're there in the Greek language is in the plural. And so he said he's addressing all of the disciples at once. Let not your hearts be troubled. But why does he say this? Well, it's because he understands that there's a reason that their hearts might be troubled at this point. The previous chapter, John chapter 13, begins what is often referred to as the upper room discourse that runs all the way through John chapter 16. And if you look back in this previous chapter, in John chapter 13, you'll discover that Jesus has just told his disciples that one of them would betray him. That Peter, in fact, would deny him three times. And that he informs his disciples that he's going away. And where he is going, they cannot now follow And so the disciples who have been in close company with Jesus for three and a half years are now told that he's leaving and they can't comprehend losing him or going on without him. And so these disciples have anxious and troubled hearts. But so do we. So do we. We also have to endure lots of bad news. Stuff that will rip our hearts out stuff that takes the wind out of our sails, stuff that drives us to our knees, and stuff that knocks the air out of our lungs, figuratively and literally knocks the air out of our lungs. And like these disciples, we also have to experience the departure of those that we love, the amputation of close relational ties because people leave, people move, and people die. And so there's so much to trouble our hearts. Alfred Lord Tennyson captures it poetically and with simplicity when he says, never morning wore to evening, but some heart did break. So what's troubling your heart today, friend? What is troubling your heart? Is it an uncertain future? Is it disrupted plans? Is it your health, concerns about your health, fear for your health or fear for the health of loved ones? Is it the loss of a relationship? Is it the loss of a job? Is it the possible loss of income? Or is it a crumbling economy that's troubling your heart? Well, hear the words of Jesus to his disciples this morning. Let not your hearts be troubled. Not that it's wrong to have a troubled heart in light of the troubles in this world. It's actually unrealistic and fraudulent to be cheerful and merry all the time in this world. And Jesus isn't rebuking his disciples here. But at the same time, he's also not promising them or us that all of our troubles in this life, all that troubles our heart will just vanish, disappear, and evaporate. But what he is teaching them and us is that our troubles and the troubles that we experience in this life are not the definitive feature of our existence, nor are they the final and ultimate word of our stories. There's more. There's something that transcends trouble and gives us hope. And that's why Jesus says, believe in God. 
and believe also in me. Now these can be translated as commands as we have them here in the ESV. Believe in God, believe also in me. But they could be translated simply as statements. You believe in God, you also believe in me. But any way you translate it, Jesus is pointing his disciples, he's pointing his followers to faith and trust in God. Not just a faith that he exists, but a trust that he is sovereign, that he's reigning, that he's in control, and that he's good, and his plans and purposes are good. He's pointing them to faith and trust in God, but also faith and trust in him, in the midst of their trouble, as healing for the troubled heart. But as he does so, notice that he's also elevating himself to the same level as God. I mean, what other mere person would say, believe in God, and to the same degree that you're believing and trusting in him, trust in me also. But that's what Jesus does here. Christian commentator A.W. Pink unpacks Jesus' words like this, paraphrasing. He says, you believe in God, who is invisible. You believe in his love, though you have never seen his form. You are conscious of his care, though you have never touched the hand that guides and protects you. Believe in me also. In like manner, you must have full confidence in my existence, my love, and care, even though I am no longer present to sight. So because I am caring for you, I am watching over you, let not your hearts be troubled. But we're given something even more specific to trust and hope in as Jesus points us to the Father's house in verse 2. He says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Now again, this can be translated as a statement as well as a question. So some of your translations might translate it this way. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. But again, either as a statement or a question, the essence remains the same. Jesus says that he's going away, and he's going away to prepare a place for his followers, and this place is a room in the Father's house. That's what Jesus is telling his disciples. And so notice what's implied here. Jesus is going away, to be sure, which means he's going to die. But Jesus doesn't stay dead. He's risen from the tomb on Easter morning. And so he's alive now. We worship a living Savior. But that might prompt the question, if Jesus is alive, where is he? Well, he has ascended and is in the presence of the Father in heavenly glory. And one of the things that he's doing there is preparing a place for you, Christian, a place in the Father's heavenly home. And the promise with which Jesus is soothing the troubled heart here with the promise of the Father's house is actually a promise that runs through the whole of the Bible. Humanity in the beginning was created to live with God, in his presence with joy, to live in fellowship with him, dwelling in their midst. This is the way it was in the Garden of Eden, is God dwelled with the people there and walked with his people. And that was their home. But because Adam and Eve sinned, they were driven from their home in Eden, and they were exiled from before his face. And not only that, but God established the place of his special dwelling, not on earth, but in a place called heaven. So God resides now in heaven in a, in a special, particular way where his glory manifests rather than on earth. But even after sin, God in his grace was still committed to dwell in the midst of a people that he called his own. And so he gave instructions to build a tabernacle and then later a temple. And he resided, took up residence in the tabernacle and the temple throughout the Old Testament. But the people sinned again and so the temple was destroyed. But God in his grace was still committed to dwelling in the midst of his people. So this time he comes to dwell among his people in the true temple. The divine presence himself, the second person of the Trinity, the risen Lord Jesus comes to dwell among his people. He is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And during his time on earth, Jesus rescued his people from their exile by becoming exiled himself, by enduring an exile on the cross where he was forsaken by the Father. But through his exile, 
We are now welcomed into the presence of the Father again. We are reconciled to him. And after Jesus completed that work of redemption and reconciliation, he was resurrected. He ascended into heaven where he's preparing a place for us where he also poured out the Holy Spirit by whom God now dwells in the hearts of believers. God is present in our hearts by faith in the hearts of believers. But that's not it. There's still more as we anticipate the future because Jesus will come again as he declares in verse three. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Now it seems that this promise of the Father's house is provisionally realized when we die and go to heaven in the presence of the Father where Jesus is now. There's kind of a provisional fulfillment in the believer's death going to heaven. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where we read in verse 6. Paul writes, we know that while we are at home in the body, at home in the body, meaning this life on this earth, while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord who is in heaven. But he then goes on to say in verse 8, we would rather be away from the body, meaning when the soul departs the body, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord, meaning when we die and we go to heaven. When Christians die, the soul is at home with the Lord. Now, the Bible actually gives us little details about what this kind of existence is like. We probably want more details about it. But although we don't know a lot about it, Paul seems to suggest here that that existence is kind of like going home. It's not like entering into some strange foreign territory but rather like entering into the presence of the arms of a welcoming, loving father and finding brothers and sisters and family there who know you and whom you also know. But that provisional realization is not our ultimate homecoming. Our ultimate homecoming is actually realized when Jesus himself comes back to this earth as Pastor Bob preached a few, a few weeks ago from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. At that time when our bodies will be raised from the dead. Just as Jesus' body was raised from the tomb on Easter morning, our bodies will be raised from the dead. And as Jesus comes back, this heavenly Jerusalem descends to the earth. We see this picture in Revelation chapter 21 where heaven and earth are merged, where God makes his dwelling with his people once again. And the words of Revelation chapter 21 verse three find their fulfillment Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. Life in his presence, in a new heavens and on a new earth. Eden completely restored. Home at last. Now you might still be having some trouble wondering what's taking so long for the realization of this why Jesus hasn't come back yet. And we get at least a partial answer here in John chapter 14. Our groom is busy preparing a place for his bride, for you and for me. And the scriptures tell us that it will be worth the wait. That is hope and that is joy for the troubled heart. But if that's our true home, if that's the home that awaits us, this new heavens and this new earth, how do we get there? How can we make sure we arrive? And so we read also of Jesus revealing to us the way home. The way home. After speaking of the Father's house, Jesus says in verse 4, and you know the way to where I am going. And this prompts this question from Thomas. And he asks immediately in verse 5, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And of course, we can sympathize with Thomas's question because that's how we would feel. How, how are we supposed to know the way if we don't have an address that we can type into our Google Maps on our iPhones? How are we supposed to know how to get there? Listen, the way home is not a spatial direction like north, south, east, or west. The way home is a person. The way home is Jesus. And he answers Thomas's question in verse 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Notice that Jesus isn't just talking here to his disciples about the way. He's not saying that he knows 
where the way is and he can point them in the right direction to ensure that they get there. That's what other religions say. That's what other religious teachers say. This is the way. This, that is the truth. This is the way home. This is the life. That's not what Jesus is doing. That's not what Jesus does. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one comes to the Father. No one enters into eternal life. No one experiences home in eternal glory except through me. The valley of the shadow of death is a profound, uncharted mystery for all of us. A step into the darkness of the great unknown. And how can we be sure that we can navigate our way through that valley of the shadow of death to find life? To navigate that valley to find the light of home. When Jesus says, you know the way, Christian. We've been given a certain knowledge about the way through death to life, to heavenly glory, a way to the resurrection of the dead. Jesus is the way. And so look to him by faith. Believe in God and believe in him. Trust in him. Look to him by faith and follow him. And if you're doing that, if you're looking to Jesus by faith as your savior, as your redeemer, as your king, and you're following him, your homecoming is certain. He's gone before to ensure your arrival. And if you're not looking to him by faith, you can look to him by faith now and know that he is preparing a place for you. In the difficult days following World War II in Great Britain, King George VI, who was himself dying of cancer at the time, although the people didn't know it, gave a Christmas Eve address to the people to encourage them as they looked forward to an uncertain new year following the war. And this is what he said. He said, I said to the man at the gate of the year, Give me a light that I may walk safely into the unknown. And he said, go out into the darkness and put your hand in the hand of God and it shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. Put your hand in the hand of God. Take your troubled heart, put it in the hands of God and that will be safer than the known better than the light. We can put our hand in the hand of God by placing our faith in Jesus. So let not your hearts be troubled. Not because there's no trouble in this life. There's lots of it. But let not your hearts be troubled because our departing, our risen, our ascended Savior offers hope to the troubled heart with the promise of home. Let not your hearts be troubled because Jesus is risen from the dead. He has gone ahead to prepare a place for us in heaven and he's coming back to get us, to take us there, to take us home where he is. And where he is, is our home. You see, the home that we ultimately long for and belong to is also a person. Jesus is our home. Our home where Jesus is and where he is, there we will also be because he's coming to take us there. Now it is true that we'll have to go through much trouble before then. As the hymn Amazing Grace teaches us to sing through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. But listen, it goes on and has us sing these words. Tis grace that brought us safe thus far and grace will lead us home. Just as the way home is a person, so also grace is not a thing. It's not a substance. Grace comes to us in a person, the person and work of Jesus, risen from the dead. In the closing chapter of the last book of the Chronicles of Narnia, it's a book called The Last Battle, Aslan comes to take everyone home. And they are headed away from Narnia and are about to enter Aslan's land, but they're met with familiar scenes on the way. And it's the unicorn who cries out this, I've come home at last. This is my real country. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. And the reason why we had loved the old Narnia is that it sometimes looked a little like this. 
The same is true for us, friends, that all of the love and the belonging and the stability and security and safety and peace and order that we've experienced in this life have all been but glimpses of our true home, where Jesus is. And that's a home where every tear will be wiped away. Death is no more. There'll be no more crying and no more pain and no more trouble and therefore no more troubled hearts. That is the hope and the promise of Resurrection Sunday. And that is what Easter means for us. Hallelujah and amen. Let's pray. Lord, we bring our troubles and our troubled hearts to you today and thank you that you care for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you have given hope to our troubled hearts with the promise of home. Thank you that you endured exile for us on the cross, that we might be reconciled and welcomed into the presence of your Father and our Father. And thank you that you conquered death through your resurrection, that you poured out your Holy Spirit so that we already have been given new spiritual life as we await your return. And as we wait, give us faith and trust in your preparing a place for us in your love and your mercy. And we thank you that this life is not all trouble, that we experience much joy and goodness and many blessings in this life. We thank you for the glimpses of love, belonging, order, peace, stability, warmth, and safety that we enjoy by your grace as foretastes of your coming kingdom. And Lord, since we have already been made partakers of that coming kingdom by the new life we have in your spirit that dwells in our hearts, help us be conduits of those things and a fragrance of that love, security, order, and peace as our lives exhibit the power of new life in Christ Jesus, our risen and reigning Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Let us proclaim and let us rejoice in this, that Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Receive now his blessing from his word. And now may the God of peace himself, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Christ Jesus, our risen Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.